the path of, of Raja Yoga, even stricter, even stricter. They have the absolute control over the bodies, all sorts of different things. The path of Bhakti, Bhakti Yoga, this Adhikara doesn't apply, it's open to everybody. No one is excluded. Uh, the only requirement is a little sincerity, a little real desire, sincere desire for devotion, and some purity of life, of course. The minimum, that, that has to be there. Now, the distinction, the second distinction, that forms the basis of this, this talk, that's from Bhudeshananji Maharaj gave, was between what we're entitled to and what we're prepared to do. So he uses another term, prastuti. So we have this adhikara, uh, which is one thing, it's open to everybody, but are we ready for it? I'll give an example. There are a lot of retirement communities. I don't know if you probably have them here also, but in our area, a lot of retirement communities, 55 and over, and anybody who lives there, by right, can have a little plot of land to grow some flowers or vegetables, a little garden, community garden type of thing. If you, if you have a place there, then, then you're entitled to do it. Maybe you, you have to pay $10 a month, something like that. But you're entitled to do it. So if anybody can do it, uh, if somebody goes and they s simply throw some seeds and everything, they don't do the weeding, they don't fertilize, they don't do any preparation, they won't get a good crop. So this is the distinction that he's making, that this path of devotion is open to everybody, but if we want to be successful, then we have to prepare the heart, prastuti. This is a term that he used, we have to prepare the heart. So his talk really is all about not who's qualified to do it, but who will really um, make the best use of it. What do we have to do in order to uh, give, give ourselves the best chance that, that seed will grow into a, a huge tree that, that will really be successful. The path of devotion, uh, what are we trying to achieve in the path of devotion? Devotion itself. This is, even their devotees who say, I don't care about God realization even. I just want to have that love for God. I want to offer everything to God. If he gives the God realization, fine. If not, I don't care. This is, this is according to Followers of the path of devotion, not of the Bhakti Sutra, we read this. This distinguishes the path of bhakti from every other path. That uh, followers of devotion care for nothing but, but devotion itself. And doing everything is an offering to God, not caring about getting anything in return. This is shuddha bhakti. This is what Thakur means by pure devotion. That there's no motive behind it, no selfish motive at all. It is done with a perfectly pure and innocent type of heart and not caring for what we get out of the whole thing. The Gita, of course, is one of our great sources for this. And uh, there we find that uh, it's open to everybody, even those who don't, who haven't led a very pure type of life. See, the Gita, uh, was written specifically, specifically for those who were left out. It's a very interesting, there are a lot of even verses about this, that the Shruti was, was really, it was for the very high class people. And uh, it was almost out of compassion for everybody else that this Mahabharata and Ramayana and the Puranas and everything were written. So the common people, people who didn't know Sanskrit even, the common people, who uh, were not considered qualified for anything higher, they would get the same truths presented to them. So we find a very nice verse. Apiched sudarachado, bhajate mamananya bhak, sadhar eva samantavya, samyak vyavasito hisa. Even if the, the vilest sinner worships me with exclusive devotion, he is, he is to be considered righteous, for he has made the proper resolve. So it's a very low bar for who can practice this path of devotion. That even if we feel that we've led a, uh, a very unclean type of life, that we're not fit for it, that it's open to us. It's open to everybody. In fact, those who feel that, uh, they're the ones who really should practice it. I remember reading a very nice statement by Swami Ashokananiji 
that he said, I find so often the devotees stop coming, and I asked them, why have you stopped coming? They said, Swami, we, we feel that we're not fit for it, that the mind is, is having bad thoughts, and we don't feel that devotion. And he said, that's when you should come. <laughs> he said, when you're feeling cold, that's when you come near the fire. He said, that is, so well, uh, it's open to everyone, but... It's not such a simple thing, though it's open, okay. We have to do this type of, of preparation. The first thing, of course, is this idea of purifying the heart. And Sri Ramakrishna gives a very nice example of this. When we read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, we find he had a very interesting technique, very interesting way of explaining things, that he would have a song in, in mind, and the song sometimes would, would have a little story in it, and he would tell the story first, then he would sing the song. It's a pedagogic technique, huh? <laughs> but of course it was just natural to him, he, not that he thought these things out. It was just natural, but it was his style, it was a very nice way of doing it. So we read in the Gospel, this is Takwar speaking, there lived in a village a young man named Padmalochan. People used to call him Podo for short. In this village, there was a temple in a very dilapidated condition. It contained no image of God. A shwata and other plants sprang up on the ruins of its walls. Bats lived inside, and the floor was covered with dust and the dropping of the bats. The people of the village had stopped visiting the temple. One day after dusk, the villagers heard the sound of a conch shell from the direction of the temple. They thought perhaps Someone had installed an image in the shrine and was performing the evening worship. One of them softly opened the door and saw Padmalochin standing in a corner, blowing the conch. No image had been set up. The temple hadn't been swept or washed, and filth and dirt lay everywhere. Then he shouted to Podo. Now the song comes. So now Takwa is singing this, this song. You have set up no image here within the shrine, O fool. Blowing the conch, you simply make confusion worse, confounded. Day and night, eleven bats scream there incessantly. O Podo, you have no image of Madhva in your temple. And behold, you have not even taken the trouble of cleansing and purifying the temple. Day and night, the eleven bats screech here. Then Takwa explains the eleven bats are the five organs of action, the five organs of perception, and the mind. So this is, this is uh, our condition, not that bad of course, but this is our condition that uh, we want to start immediately setting up the shrine and worshiping, but we have to do a little bit of that cleansing. We have to clean, clean the heart. That means uh, most, mostly bringing in pure thoughts. See, we, we don't have to fight so much that any negative thinking that comes if we bring in the positive. This was always Takwa's method. Don't fight these other things, bringing something positive. Uh, the, just bring the thought of God. How do we bring in the thought of God? We keep holy company. We read the Gospel of Shrami Krishna and the Holy Mother, all of these things. We, this coming to the center, all of these different things are, are ways that we, that we start to do that. Changing the, uh, our habits, the people that we visit, the company that we keep, all of these things are different ways of doing that. Then we have to find out, or we do find out, uh, what really is required. How much of, of, of the cleansing is required and, and how much of longing for God, how much of real, devo of, of real dedication is required in this path of devotion, which we're told is easy. Remember, we're told this is the easy path. Huh. <laughs> then we have a, a very nice incident in the life of Swami Premananda. Swami Premananda, our direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. It's a very interesting story with him that uh, in the very early days, you know, when Swamiji came back from the West and instituted uh, this whole mission, Ramakrishna mission, which was dedicated to the social uplift and to, to preaching. And uh, they all said, Takwa said, 
well, who is qual qualified to preach? We have to get the, the badge of authority. We have to realize God first. So they thought, no, no, this is Swamiji's idea, that uh, they had little objection to that. And uh, who, who can help the world? That uh, this is something Thakur said, first realize God, then worry about these things. So there's a little hesitation. Some of the, uh, his brother disciples and some of uh, uh, other non-monastic disciples, but they had so much faith in Swamiji that no one really rebelled or anything, and they knew Thakur was living in Swamiji. And this was, but anyhow, it took a while for some of them to come around. So Swami Premananda had a little doubt. He was a little more uh, orthodox in his ideas of monastic life and everything. Then a period came later in his life when he had a, a very severe illness. They thought he was going to die. Now there's a second story here. You may remember that Swami Premananda's mother was a great devotee of Sri Ramakrishna. And when Sri Ramakrishna wanted, this, Babu Ram was his name, Babu Ram to live with him and eventually become a monk, that he went to her and he said, I want your son. And she said, okay, but does a mother give away a son without getting something in return? And he said, okay, then what do you want? And he said, you promise me that I won't live so long to see the death of any of my children. So he said, okay. And then when the Swami Premananda was so ill, everyone thought he was dying. And he said, no, I can't die. And they said, why not? He said, my mother's still alive. The Thakur promised that. So he recovered from that illness. But while he was bedridden, he read all of the works of Swami Vivekananda. He didn't know English very well, so whatever was translated into Bengali, he read all of that, and he used to say, it created a tremendous revolution in my mind. And now I really understand what Swamiji was doing, this uh, uh, worshiping God by service to other beings. This was Thakur's message. So wherever he spoke, he would talk about Swamiji's ideal of, of worship of God through the service of mankind. So he was in uh, Malda. He was giving a talk there. And uh, somebody in the audience kept saying, Swamiji, we want to hear about, about prema. We want to hear about divine love. And he didn't pay any attention. So the deputy asked several times. Then he said, OK, you want to hear about that. Is anybody qualified to hear, to hear about that? And then he said, let me tell you a story. There was once a man. They called it Fediwala. These are uh, kind of door-to-door uh, -door salesmen. You can say they walk down the middle of the street hawking their wares. So they'll, they'll have pots and pans or something and, and they'll bang them and, and say pots for sale and people will come out. So one man was there walking down the street and nobody knew it was for sale, but they all came out. And they said, what are you selling? He said, I'm selling prema. I'm selling divine love. Who wants it? They all said, oh, we want it. We want it. Everybody lined up. They all wanted it. And then one of them said, what's the price? What does it cost? And he said, it'll cost your head. And they said, oh, no, no, we don't want it. And they all ran inside. So what are we willing to sacrifice? And what does it mean to give the head? It means a whole life has to be devoted. Now, one thing I want to emphasize is that we're getting this high bar so that we can try to get a little bit higher. None of us can... can well, all of the things that uh, Swami says in this, in this lecture uh, are things to aspire to. None of us can, can really say that, yes, uh, I'm willing to give my whole life uh, for this. Uh, but it gives us a high ideal, a goal to try to aspire to. I remember in uh, Trabuco, the monastery where I, where I stayed for so long, one of, the, one of the brothers had a little sign on his door that if you try to jump over the moon, you'll be able to jump over the fence. Huh? So we, sh we should have a high ideal, understanding that it'll help us go a little higher, but, but we shouldn't feel like failures if we can't you know, go that high. So this, these are all things that we have to try to aspire to. Uh, understand and appreciate. Appreciate what it really means. This purnahuti, uh, we have this beautiful term, the offering of everything. To off, you know, at the end of the Homa sacrifice, that there's something, this point of Huti, that they talk about that the very final line is now, I offer myself and everything that I have into the fire of Sri Ramakrishna. So, it's, as I say, at that moment we may feel like it, 
Yeah. And then we think, no, but I have my family and friends and, and job, all of these things. That's natural. We shouldn't feel bad about that. But at least at some time we have to realize that uh, if we want the highest, we have to offer everything. So uh, this, this is, is something, as I say, that we, we have to aspire to, that we shouldn't think that this will be an easy thing. We have to keep reminding ourselves this path of devotion is, is the easy path, but it's not that easy at all. So the first piece of advice that we find in this lecture is probably the most important thing. Is it the Swami Bhudeshanandi? He says, Aikantikota. That means that this has to be the one single thing in our life. The one single thing in our life, then sarvanta karane, with all of our heart, ananya mana, with the mind not caring about anything else, that we have to think of God, meditate on God, like that. We can do it just at the time when we sit for meditation, when we, when we sit for prayer. At least at that moment, we can think nothing else means anything to me. Afterwards, we have our family, we have everything else, but at least at that time, we can do it. I always think that these different spiritual attitudes and, and spiritual paths are meant for different periods of our life and, and different times of the day, even. That we may say that, uh, to say that this world is unreal like a dream, it won't be very helpful for me when I'm doing my work. But when I sit for meditation, then I can say, let me think that this world is nothing. It's just a little mud puddle, a little passing fancy and everything, and dive deep within. At least at that time we can do it. So at the time of prayer, at least, we can have this feeling, the whole mind absorbed in God, with all of our heart and soul, allowing no other thought to enter into the mind. Then he quotes again from Gita, another very famous verse, those devotees who worship me without allowing any other thought to enter their minds. For them, yoga kshema vaham yaham, I take care of it, all of their needs. Whatever they have, I preserve. Whatever they need, I'll provide. Minimum things, not, not big things or anything. This is, this is the way the devotee feels that uh, whatever comes of its own, without too much effort, that this is enough for me. This is another part of, of what it means to be prepared for this path of devotion, contentment. Whatever comes. Now, whatever comes doesn't mean we don't try for things. We have to make that effort. But we're successful, we're not successful. Mother's will, that's all. We have to accept it. Acceptance and contentment. These, these are uh, a big part of, of what it means to be a devotee, a real devotee. And we find in Gita, we find so many of these phrases that manmana, uh, matparayana, matpara, that you have to look upon me, this Sri Krishna saying, you look upon God as the, the beginning and end of everything, as the supreme, the most important thing in life. This, this, uh, this, this having this devotion to this one uh, ultimate goal of, of life, that this is, this is the, the prastuti, this is the, how we make that preparation uh, to have really to be able to uh, let devotion grow into the heart. So he adds, then, these two things, surrender and acceptance. That if, if we say that, yes, Mother, everything is your will, and then we don't accept things, and, and we, we worry about things, what will happen in the future. And see, we see a real devotee sometimes, they don't worry. This is a great test, a great test. Those who are always worried, anxiety, well, what will happen? They say, no, Mother is there, she'll take care of everything. There's a very beautiful song, Ma Achen Ar Ami Achi Bhabna Ki Achi A very beautiful song. It's so simple that the devotee says, Mother is there, I have my mother. Mother's there and I'm here. Then what do I have to worry about? Huh? I have my mother, she'll look after me. So Thakur always talks about the, the kitten, the attitude of the kitten. The kitten doesn't care that the mother may take it and put it in the, in the ashes in the fireplace or in, in the bed of the master, doesn't care. My mother put me here. It must be the best thing for me. So then there's no anxiety. There's no worry about anything. So this surrender and acceptance 
He says that these are the two most important things. He said, we shouldn't approach God as beggars. Give me this, give me that. We say, whatever comes, it comes, and we accept that. It doesn't mean that we don't try. This is, this is a common mistake that many people make. If we live in the world and uh, we have our jobs, we have our school, we have, to, we have to do our best. We have to really try to do our best, but we accept whatever comes. That's all. We accept it. And if we're real devotees, we say, no, it's not just the, the will of God, it's the grace of God. <laughs> see? See how the attitude changes. Sometimes bad things happen with God's will. Good things happen, oh, through God's grace it happened. Real devotees, everything is God's grace because we learn from everything. We look back, the worst things that happened in our lives sometimes turn out to be the greatest blessings for us. Only we don't understand it at the time. So this is all an attitude. This is why Thakur says the mind is everything. What our attitude, this is the most important thing. The external things are, are very much secondary. If we're content with very simple things, then we're happy. If we're not content with, with getting big, fancy things, then what's the use of getting them? So uh, uh, these are all uh, different spiritual attitudes that are very, very uh, helpful. And then we have this concept of sincerity. I've always wondered exactly how we explain this concept of sincerity. What does it really mean to, to be sincere about things? The Bengali term, antarikata, it, it means that which is deep within our heart. When we say something, that we feel it. We're not just saying it, we, don't, not, we mean it, but it's more than that. Somehow it goes very deep within. And uh, this becomes a, one of the most important prerequisites. I remember when many years ago, this was... This was 1973, before I was connected with the order even, that uh, I went to India and I went to a place called Almora. Now we have a nice big center there, but I didn't know about the center. Uh, I only knew Almora because my avati was in the Almora district. I didn't know anything. I thought I'll go there and I'll find my avati somehow. Uh, but there was a place, <coughs> before you get to our ashram, it was called Ram Krishna Dham. And I'm sure nobody has ever been there or seen it. I don't know if it's even a small place. And uh, to my surprise, there was an American sadhu there who had been there his whole life. He must have been in his 80s at that time. And uh, he was a monk of our order who went to Almora uh, because they thought he couldn't handle the climate and... and uh, Kolkata and other parts, so they, they sent him there. Many of the other monks went there just to get some rest. You know, they'd work hard and everything. So he thought, ah, I've come for sadhana, spiritual practice, they're just resting. He was a little proud at that time. So anyhow, he left, but remained a monk. His name was Mangal Chaitanya. And he started this other little place. There were a few people there, looked after him and everything. Very nice men, although I liked him. We spent a lot of time. But the one thing that he kept saying, is first you have to be sincere. There was one thing. He had no other special teaching that, that he was interested. He just kept stressing that idea. You have to be sincere. So w w the sincerity, th this is the test of that. Are we willing to accept what comes? Are we always fighting against things? Or are we always uh, trying to get more of this or that? Or do we feel that we know what's best for ourselves? That this is one of the tests. If we really have sin sincerely say, that everything is thy will, O Mother. If we really say that, there's a test for that. Uh, what type of anxiety, what type of frustration do we have in everything? So the sincerity uh, is, is really one of the most important. If we're sincere, everything follows. If we have a sincere, not even sincere love for God, if we have a sincere desire to love God, who can say that they have a sin? We don't know who is God, what is God, how much do we know of that? But some real longing, sincere longing, to follow this path of devotion and to know what it feels. We see these great souls. We see tears coming from their eyes. To have that longing, to ha have that, to attain to that type of, of devotion. So then we, have, we go to this idea of, of surrender. Now, I really want to emphasize this idea that uh, there's no contradiction between 
self-effort and surrender, that actually we have to do self-effort first. Takwa tells many stories that uh, sometimes have two meanings. Sometimes there's a secondary meaning that we overlook. <clears throat> I think one of these is the parable of the bird that falls asleep on the mast of a ship. I'm sure everybody knows this, this story, that there's a, a bird that got tired and, and uh, sat on the mast of a ship that was anchored at shore and fell asleep. By the time the bird woke up, the ship was all the way out to sea. And the bird said, well, I want to fly back to land, but couldn't see land anywhere. So it flew as far as it could fly with all of its energy until it was so tired that it knew that it had to turn around, otherwise it would be sunk. So it turns around, goes back, and then rests, and does it in every direction, and doesn't find land anywhere, and then says, okay, wherever the ship takes me, I'll go, I'll be happy. Now, we understand that that's that ultimate reliance and surrender on God. But we have to remember that it doesn't happen until the bird flies in every direction. If the bird at the beginning said it, wherever the boat takes me, some doubt would be there. That, ah, but I could have flown that way and found land, and uh, maybe I'll try later, but now that's all gone. So we do everything we can to have whatever God realization, whatever it is, and then we say, now grace has to come. That, uh, and that's when it can come. It doesn't come before then, when we still think, no, it's up to me. But we have to start out with that idea. The, Swamiji makes a great statement. When you do anything, feel that everything is up to you. When it comes to the result, feel that everything is up to God. Then we, we give up everything. But we, we have to do this, uh, try our very best to be successful at, at every, we, whatever we do, because we're doing everything as an offering. So we have to be successful. We have to do things uh, in, in a very careful and, and uh, pleasing, beautiful way if we want to do it as an offering. So then he really gets to this idea of purity of heart and what are the things we need to acquire within the heart. And we get another parable that Sri Ramakrishna tells that there was a king in a very small, simple kingdom it wasn't a big fancy kingdom that the people, the subjects of the kingdom were simple peasant people. And he was a very good king, benevolent king. And he wanted to visit one of the homes of, of one of the subjects of, of his kingdom. So he told his ministers, you find one house, a typical family, and I want to come and, and see how they're doing and what their uh, desires and needs are and everything. So you make the arrangements. So the minister found one family and told that family that, look, you're going to have a special visitor. Do you mind if we come and clean up your house a little bit? So they said, no, that's fine. So they swept everything out, painted it, did everything. Then do you mind if we bring in uh, some nice furniture and we bring in a little tea set and uh, some nice snacks? We All of these things. They said, no, that's fine. Okay. And then the, everything is arranged. Then the king comes. Now, what Takwa is saying is that both are instances of, of grace that if we want God to enter into the heart, first, this is also a type of grace, that uh, we find out that there's a chance that uh, really the king can come and enter, and then all arrangements are made. We cleanse ourselves of all this negativity and everything, all of our attachments and, and desires, passions and everything. Then we have to acquire this vivek, I'd argue, all of the different things, dispassion and uh, discrimination and, and, and devotion, shred the faith, all of these things. These are the, the, the tea set and the furniture and everything. Then everything is ready. And then uh, we're, we're perfectly prepared. Then the king comes. And, uh, and he visits so the beautiful the parable. And when we talk about this, this uh, viveka, this... Uh, of course, people don't like the word discrimination anymore. It has this uh, negative connotation, discernment. But it really means uh, distinguishing between what is real and what is unreal. Now, the, the jnani has his own way of doing it with uh, very high principles, high teachings of uh, what is eternal, non-eternal, uh, the subject and the object. Devity doesn't have to bother about any of that. What is important and what is not important. We have that distinction in the Katupanishad between Shreyas and Preyas. What's enjoyable 
what's pleasant. There's nothing harmful about it, but well, what's really of, of higher value and uh, what, what really will lead to uh, a deeper type of, of, uh, of contentment in life. That type of, of uh, discrimination is, is what's most important. Then he talks about what happens if we don't purify the heart first, if we don't uh, do this cleansing and everything. And again, we get uh, a couple of very nice parables. Uh, one of these is about bringing water to the field. You know, Takra has so many examples. He lived in the agricultural area. There's so many beautiful examples. How he observed things, what a power of observation he had uh, to observe <coughs> how they would irrigate the field. There'll, there'll be a reservoir that'll be a little higher than the rest of the field, and someone has to dig a channel to get the water into the field, so, and then they, they can simply raise the, the floodgate, and the water will come of its own. So he says that he noticed that sometimes if the, uh, if the farmer wasn't very careful, that there would be little holes or little gaps, places where the channel wasn't fully made, and the water would run out through them, and it would never reach the field. So he said, what are these holes? These are our worldly desires. And then the, another nice illustration that the three men uh, go out drinking one night and they get stumbling drunk. And they're just walking around and one of them says, uh, oh, there's a boat there. Let's, let's get in the boat and we'll row over to the other side. So they get in the boat and they're rowing all night long. They're rowing and rowing and rowing. And when the sun comes up, they say they haven't moved at all. And they say, what happened? And one looks down and says, yes, nobody raised the anchor. So uh, our spiritual practice isn't exactly like that, that, uh, of course, some of the water will get into the field. The holes we have aren't that big, but not all of it. And uh, we're not completely anchored, but we won't get the full results of our spiritual practice. Uh, when we have these, these worldly desires, we'll uh, prevent at least getting the, the full benefit of all of our spiritual practice. Now we get uh, a, a couple of very, very important uh, teachings, and we can sum this up with uh, something that we find in this, this hymn that was composed by Chaitanya Deva. Uh, in all of our Southern California centers, we recite the English translation that was done by Christopher Isherwood and Swami Prabhavanandi. Uh, and most people are familiar with this, especially this, uh, be humbler than a blade of grass, be patient and forbearing like the tree, give honor to all, take honor from none, <coughs> chant unceasingly the name of the Lord. This is an English translation. The original, the original language is slightly different a very important distinction. This tornadapi sunichena. So this is fine. That uh, just as a, a blade of grass, that people step on it, walk on it. It doesn't mind. It doesn't complain. So we should be like that. Let people do what they want. A, a little bit uh, so it's humility. And then the tree, tornadapi sahishtuna. That the tree, the patience that the tree has. That. Uh, the wind and the rain, and you hear snow will come and everything. People will sit underneath it. They'll pull its bark off. They'll cut the, the twigs. They'll carve a heart on the side. And the tree doesn't mind huh? like that. And Amanina, Manadena, we shouldn't care if anybody uh, praises us. What do we care? They praise us or they don't praise us. But we show honor and respect to everybody. But then it says, Kirtaniya Sadaharihi. What this really means is that person <coughs> is qualified to chant the name of God. Kirtaniya, it can be done by such a person. So uh, it, the English translation we have is nice, but this adds a little uh, extra to it that this is also a type of prerequisite. So the real devotee will have some type of real humility. Not this, this uh, oh, I'm a terrible sinner. Thakur hated that. Swamiji hated it even more. But the real type of humility. Did Swamiji have humility? 
He did. It just didn't manifest the way we expect it to. He didn't like this, this low and meek and everything. He like, I am, I am here. I'm the lion. He had that. But he used to say that uh, Sri Ramakrishna could have created thousands of Vivekanandas from the dust of the earth. Now, think of that type of humility. And uh, he said, if I've said anything in my life, that had any truth to it, any value, any benefit. It was all his words, his words. Anything that was, was not helpful for people, that, that's on me. So he really, had, he really had great humility. There was one incident when he was uh, somewhere in West India, Gujarat maybe, and uh, he was having a conversation with the, some of these real pundits. You know, in India, they have these Sanskrit pundits who can speak Sanskrit the way uh, people can speak their native language. They're just absolutely fluent from their childhood, and uh, they can, on the spot, compose hymns and do all sorts of things. Swamiji knew Sanskrit, but not like these pundits did. So he made some mistakes, and they laughed at him. Did Swamiji get upset? He laughed also. Huh? So uh, despite that appearance that uh, you know, humility is the last thing we, we would say about him, he actually had that. So uh, these, these are really very important things, that this absence of, of pride, that this patience and forbearance and uh, this, this humble attitude and everything. If we want to be devotees, we have to try to acquire these things. Uh, if we do something wrong, we apologize. If somebody does something harmful to us, we say, ah, it's okay. This is maybe they didn't feel good that day. Well, we don't know why they did it. We don't, don't make a big deal about it. So the real devotee, we think, what has this got to do with devotion? This has everything to, to do with devotion. Then the heart is open. The heart is open for God to come in. The, otherwise, the, all these things are ego things. Takwa says that the ego is, is the stump that grows up in front of the door of the house that we can't even open the door to get in. Yeah. So the, the ego is really, these are all things to help us get rid of the ego. Now, there's a last piece of advice, okay, that uh, Swami Bhutashananji Maharaj talks about, which again may not seem to be such an important thing for devotion, but he says that this, this final thing, most important thing, is unselfishness. It's very interesting. He writes, We won't be able to love God till we become unselfish. This may not be possible in the beginning, but as we progress, we can become more and more unselfish. Devotion and selfishness are like light and darkness. They can never go together. Swamiji loved this idea of unselfishness. He said God himself is selflessness. Unselfishness is God. That, uh, uh, all Swamiji wanted was some people who would come willing to sacrifice everything and just live for others. He said so many, so many beautiful statements. May I be born again and again. And, 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 uh, I don't care if I have to come again just to, to help one person. Uh, so there's unselfishness. Why? Because selfishness is based on ego, and the ego is what prevents devotion. If we can learn to be unselfish, that means think about other people more than ourselves. I, my favorite, favorite statement that Swamiji made was, they alone live who live for others. The rest are more dead than alive. Really, just astounding that someone could, could make a statement like that. And that was Swamiji. He's, he lived his whole life for others, nothing for himself. He really had this desire to be, lead a retired life and, and uh, spend his time in meditation and everything. Everything he did was for, for the benefit of others. So these are all the characteristics and the things, that, the preparation things and everything. But remember the second half of this title, that uh, what are the means of attaining all of these things? How do we attain the characteristics of pure devotion? And, and why does he combine these two things? The very simple reason that the means of attaining these characteristics are by practicing these characteristics. 
There's no other way to do it. There's no trick to it. That uh, how do we attain uh, unselfishness? By being unselfish. So it turns out that these are all the things that we have to practice. Uh, when we read this Stita Pragna section in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, that gives all of the characteristics of the sage of steady wisdom, that Shankaracharya makes a very big point that why, why are we given all of these characteristics of, of this of god relay soul? And he says, so that we can practice them for the sake of sadhana. It's not simply so we can recognize someone. Oh, that person has that quality. That must be a very high soul. That's not the purpose of it. The point is that if the, the god realized soul sees the same divine presence within everyone, doesn't make any distinctions, high and low, then we have to do that. that so all of these things that we've spoken of as characteristics of someone with a great devotion, that these are the things that are the means to attaining that as well. When we read uh, chapter 12 of the Gita, this is a very well-known chapter. Many people learn this and memorize this on Bhakti Yoga. The last section of that chapter is devoted to what are the characteristics of, of someone who is a real devotee. So Sri Krishna is all of these. Such a person is very dear to me. None of them have anything to do with uh, well, that such a person is weeping for me and, and chanting my name and singing and dancing and praying to me constantly. It's all about these qualities of same-sightedness and contentment and purity and uh, not becoming agitated, calmness and all of these things, all of the, the preparation things, all of the things that uh, allow the heart uh, to, to be ripe, to be ready to uh, accept uh, that, that divine presence, we, the, the divine presence is there, of course, but if, in order for us to really uh, experience it and for us to feel it. So I'm going to stop. I just want to read some of the things that uh, are there at the end of this chapter 12. It begins with this idea, be friendly and compassionate to all. See, there's, I won't say counterintuitive, we can understand it, but why will this be the first thing? If we want to be great devotees of God, then we should think only about God. No, we have to, we have to really have a, a, a nice, sweet relationship with other people. And for us, it means seeing God within all others. Free from I and mine, so we don't care about our possessions, we don't care about... Uh, that someone will praise us. We don't even feel that uh, I deserve credit for this. Yeah, I, I was an instrument. I played my part. But if it was successful, then God's will. The same in pain and pleasure, forbearing, ever content with the mind fixed on God, not disturbed by the world, causing no disturbance to it. Then a long list. Independent. The independent means not relying on other people, relying on God. Independent, pure, detached, no big ups and downs, neither rejoicing nor hating, neither grieving nor longing for enjoyment. The same to friend and foe, the same in honor and dishonor, cold and heat, praise and blame, content with what comes on its own. We find this, this phrase in a couple of different places in, in Gita, that uh, there will be some who practice this 100%, well, there are some sadhus who don't even beg their food. There's uh, something called this, uh, the way of the python. These other snakes go out hunting. There's a boa constrictor. They'll hang from a tree, and anything that comes near it, then it'll take. The Swamiji tried that. He did that a few times. He said, today I won't beg my food. If anybody brings it, then I'll have food. If not, I won't have food. And miraculously, someone would have a dream. The sadhu is there. Something would come like that. And then finally, a willingness to follow, follow these teachings in our lives with humility and faith and looking upon the spiritual goal as the one goal of life. So this is really is such a beautiful way of, of understanding these things. And uh, we also need to understand that when we talk about preparation, uh, preparation and practice can happen at the same time. 
It's not that we have to first purify the heart and then we do our spiritual practice because we, we purify the heart through spiritual practice. There's a, a, another very interesting parable that Sri Ramakrishna tells about the man with the vat and, uh, and people come to dye their cloth. So they all have white cloth and whatever they dip it in, it turns to that color. And Sri Ramakrishna says the mind, the mind is like freshly laundered cloth. Now we think, how is that possible? My mind is not like that. Mind is not like that. But the point is that if we want to dye the mind and, and, and get the, the, the color of the dye, then uh, we, want to, we want to wash it, of course. It has to be you know, somewhat clean. But the dye itself will do the final cleaning. Immersing our minds in the thought of God is the best way of purifying the, the mind, purifying the heart. So we have to combine them. We, and this preparation, this is a lifelong thing. So it's not that we, we first develop purity of heart and then we do our spiritual practice. We have to constantly practice all of these, these, these different qualities and characteristics we saw of, of, the, of the great devotee. So then we have the end of this talk that uh, the Swamiji recites, uh, uh, mentioned this verse, Yomam pashyati sarvatra sarvam chamai pashyati tasyaham na pranasyami sachame na pranasyati. He who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, to that devotee I am never lost, nor is he ever lost to me. God will always be near such a devotee, holding his hand and protecting him from danger. So then that's the end of that talk. So end, end of my talk. Awesome. Yeah.